You know, as we were singing that song, especially that line that says, to see your glory, I was reminded of the scripture in the book of Genesis when Jacob, who's returning from Haran, and he's coming back to his family, and he's, he's heading into perceived trouble with his brother Esau. He's not sure exactly what he's going to face. But when he gets there, he says, there's a certain verse that says, that when I saw you, I beheld your face as the face of God. I want you to think about that for a minute. Here's a man that is worried about facing a major problem, maybe even losing his life, because the last time he had seen Esau, Esau was trying to kill him. And now when he's reconciled with his brother, he says, when I saw you and I was reconciled, it's like seeing God. You know, when we gather in church, we gather to experience his glory and to be transformed by his presence. But one of the things we have to learn that is God's glory is reflected in the faces of the people that are with you. That we have to begin to look more for the glory of God in people than their failures. We were made in the image and likeness of God and sin has marred that image. Sin has destroyed that image in people and Christ came to restore and to redeem man from sin and to restore the identity that he placed in each human being. There are people outside this building that they need us. They don't need us to get all religious. They don't, they don't need our programs. They don't need our steeples. They don't need our pews. What they need is for us to discover our identity in Christ and get confident and comfortable in who Christ is making us to be. To get comfortable with the fact that, yes, you've got mistakes and you make mistakes and you sin and I sin, and yet Christ has forgiven us and is willing to forgive us. And for us to be confident in that and go outside these walls and do good to the community around us and restore the glory of God to humanity. Because that is really the mission the church of Jesus Christ is on. Is to restore to man the image and likeness and the glory of God. You see, C.K. Chesterton used to say that when Adam walked in the Garden of Eden, that all the animals would say, boy, he looks a lot like God. Because we were made in his image and likeness. One writer calls us statues of God. Now what that does when we begin to look at one another that way is it begins, as we're going to get into the message this morning, it begins to change how we look at one another. It begins to change how we drive down the street when somebody cuts us off in traffic <laughs> and say, you know, next time somebody cuts you off, it makes you late for an appointment. Just remember, they were made in the image and likeness of God, and God has sent Jesus to redeem them. Folks, God wants to do something in this church and through this church. And we're going to learn one of the secrets of fulfilling that this morning. Father, we pray as we gather, I can sense your presence here this morning. I'm just amazed, Lord, at how particularly in the last several weeks that my life and my wife's have been just so hectic and busy. And I come into church and I'm all filled with angst and turmoil about what I've got to do and all the things going on. And yet, Lord, I walk in this sanctuary and when the music begins, I can sense your presence with us. And my prayer is, Lord, if there's somebody here this morning that's lonely frustrated, overwhelmed, discouraged, isolated, bound, tired, and mostly, Lord, alone, that they could sense what I'm sensing right now, your presence in the midst of all that. Father, may we not just have church this morning and follow our bulletin but speak to us and love on us because, Lord, there are folks here this morning that just, they need a hug from you. And I pray that, Lord, you would hug them. 
and let them know it's going to be okay. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you now, Lord, to be with us as we speak your word. May it not be as the word of Bob, but Lord, may the Holy Spirit make it the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, and you may be seated. I feel like Paul, Paul slipped out the back, he's getting ready to get in his seat. Uh, I don't know who picked that song, but that drenched like rain line is very relevant, is it not? I am believing God for good weather. How many are with me? <laughs> if rain is a blessing, boy, we are really getting blessed. God is good. You know, sometime later we'll be drinking this water, so thank God for all the rain now, and thank God that we have lawnmowers to cut all this rain three times a week. And then the sun's going to come out. I pray. You know, I love summertime because usually in August my, my, my lawn turns brown. I don't have to cut it for three or four weeks, and I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> well, this morning we're going to start a new series called Diagnosis. And this, this series is really about how to diagnose and treat relational issues in our lives. Kind of like when you go to the doctor, you go to a doctor, they give you a diagnosis so that they can treat whatever ails you. If you have a disease or a disorder or a problem, they can give you a, a pill, they can give you a therapy, they can do something that can help you improve your, your physical health. That's what this series is about. Now, about four years ago, my wife Patty went for an annual checkup, and I would encourage all of us to get our annual checkups every year. And if you haven't been to the doctor to get a checkup, one of your homework's assignment is to go home this week and to set up a time to go see your, see your physician and get a checkup because it really can make a difference in your life. And I was reminded of that four years ago when Patty went in for annual review and the doctor got the stethoscope out and began to, you know, poke and prod like they normally do and took the stethoscope, we all know what a stethoscope is, put it to her chest, began to listen to her heart and said, mm, there's something funny going on in there. In fact, I think that you might have an extra beat. And it went something like this. Ba-bob. Ba-bob. Irritates. Irritates. No. And so that started a four-year journey that we've been on since that day because we had to go for subsequent follow-up visits. And so we went to the cardiologist, and the cardiologist puts all this stuff on her. She has to be attached to stuff for for 24 hours, and then we go back for the reading of that, and we find out she has 9,000 extra beats per day. Now, the doctor, we went in after that, and he said, no, that's not, that's not critical. It's, it's not really, really that as bad as it sounds. And so what we want to do is spend a little time, watch your diet, don't eat caffeine, don't get all, don't, Bob, you're going to have to make sure she doesn't get tense and under a lot of stress. And I said, doc, you need, mean I have to move out? And so we went a few months and went back for another test, and, and, and because I was so good at not getting her irritated and make, taking good care of her, she had 16,000 extra beats. And doctor said, this is getting a little bit more serious now, and so we're going to try a few more things in your diet, and we'll just see how this goes. And then we went back a few more months, and then, then we went back because I was really, really good on best behavior. I mean, I just worshipped her. I just bow, did everything she wanted. If she wanted it, I got it. And so we went back. And after all, three or four months of me just serving her and being perfect, now she's at 29,000 extra beats <laughs> per day. And the doctor said, this is a problem. He said, now you're not going to drop dead of a heart attack. You're, it's not going to be an immediate problem. But if you, we don't address this, your heart's going to wear out because it's going to work too hard. And so they put her on some medicine to make a long story short. They were able to put her on a medicine, and the medicine began to bring the beats down until they got down all the way to zero extra. So, not zero. Zero's not good. <laughs> but zero extra is really good. And the doctor said, This has never happened before. I've never had somebody go on the medicine, and it works so well. Usually, there's a few extra thousand or whatever, and, it, and that's fine enough, but this is fantastic. And then, of course, we went along for a couple more years, and now they're trying to take her off the medicine. And unfortunately, she's going to have to be on that medicine for a little bit longer because her beats began to go back up. So, but the medicine worked. And my point is this. By going for an annual checkup and using this little piece of equipment right here, 
my wife's life has been prolonged. Now she's going to get to experience 20 or 30 more years extra of marital bliss with this. <laughs> she curses the day they made a stethoscope. <laughs> and recently after the death of my brother-in-law who died of a heart attack suddenly, and then I found out that he had stopped going to the doctor and stopped taking his heart medicine, I would really encourage all of you to get a checkup. You know, we're spirit, soul, and body, and you need to take care of your body. Go to the doctor, get a checkup. And you know what? I just want, you know, just want to tell you that doctors aren't are not, there's a lot of good doctors. There might be a few out there that are bad, like preachers, but most of them are good people trying to help you. They're not just trying to get your money by selling you medicine. The medicine works. He may have been alive today if he had stayed on his medicine. And so this this stuff from a physical standpoint is really fresh to me, but it's also true relationally is that relationally, we need to do checkups every so often. We need to check our hearts. We need to find out where our hearts are because that's, what, that's where the glue, that's where our, our relationships flow out of. And every so often, we have to take the stethoscope and measure our heart and how we're doing with relationships. You know, there's some here this morning that your relationships are wearing you out. They're extra hard. There's some people who have great relationships, and we would want to improve them. No matter how great your relationships are, there are moments and seasons where you have difficulty, and what we're going to be sharing over the next few weeks will not only help those who feel like they're in a relationship. Have you ever been in, don't, don't wave your hand, but have you ever been in a relationship with people that just wear you out? I mean, you get around them, and you, you feel really good, you feel really good, you got all this energy, and then... After you're done being around them, you feel drained and dry and empty, sucked dry. Has everybody, anybody ever been in a relationship with you when they're done with you? They feel dry and empty and sucked dry. What's going on there? What's going on there is when we are in a relationship or we are the people in the relationship that have an extra heartbeat, we begin to wear on people. Those relationships get very heavy and difficult. They get very one-sided, and no one-sided relationship is fun. Relationships were meant to be mutual and reciprocal, where we give and receive, not just take or just give. And so we're going to be doing this series, and we're going to talk about several things that will help us to diagnose where our hearts are and where the relationships are and what we can do about the things that we find. A few years ago, I did a series called Pulse. Back in 2012, in fact, and, and it was, it's the core values of our church. It's the 10 core values to which I'm adding an 11th, 10 core values by which we operate, whether you realize it or not, these values are lived every day in our church. We, we govern ourselves, we, we judge how we're doing, we critique ourselves, we measure ourselves as staff, and that's coming down into our volunteers and into the congregation by these core values. And what I began to notice after doing this series, I began to notice that I began to refer to them. I began to refer to them often in my pastoral counseling as people would come in and they would seek advice. They'd come to me and talk to me about their relational problems. I began to find myself going back to these core values. Now, our core values are respect, responsibility, relevance, reliability, re realness, Relationship, reconciliation, results, reward, and rest, and to which we want to add an 11th, which is reach. Now, you don't need to memorize all those. We keep them online. But what I found is, as I was interacting with people as their pastor and helping them with problems in their relationship, that the first three values of respect, responsibility, and relevance were coming up often. And I found myself referring them to these values. And I began to notice that these values of respect, responsibility, and relevance, the way we define them, are like an x-ray machine or a tool or an instrument or like a stethoscope by which you can diagnose where and what's going wrong with our relationships. And what I would find is when relationships were going well, respect, re responsibility, and relevance were very prevalent and in the forefront. And people were doing a great job at being respectful and being relevant and being responsible. But when they had problems, they were not being very good or doing very well at these three things. They would come in with a problem one week, 
and they, we would sit down and solve the problem because I have some problem solving skills and, and we would solve a problem. Next week they would come in with a problem, a new problem, and the next week they'd come in with another problem. I began to realize that throughout all these different problems, at the root of these problems were these three things. Respect, responsibility, and relevance. And so I began to use those as a tool to get people out of my office. If I can help you diagnose and treat your own relational issues, that will save my counseling load considerably. I probably spend four or five hundred hours a year in counseling. Am I exaggerating, Matt? He thinks I do more. People need help. And what I, I define preaching as counseling in mass. If people really get a hold of the things we're saying from the pulpit, we're not just doing these because we need to fill time. As you get a hold of these things in your life, you're going to find, like, like, like I've gone to a counselor one time in the last 30 years. Now, Patty probably wish I'd gone a few more. But when I went to a counselor, I was feeling depressed. I was feeling overwhelmed. I, I felt like I was angry and getting bitter over some things that were happening in my life. And I needed somebody else to come in and look at what was going on in my heart. But most of the time, I've been able to self-diagnose. I, I put the stethoscope on my own heart and I say, now, Bob, if, in fact, if you saw me do this, you'd swear your pastor's nuts. Because I'll sit down and picture myself in the chair across the office. And I'll say, now, Bob, you come in for counseling and you're going to counsel yourself. What would you tell somebody else? Why don't you go do that? And most of the time, that has worked. But every once in a while, we, all, we need somebody else. So don't be afraid to come in and see me. But, but if I can give you tools, it's amazing, like in my own marriage, by using these three things, it has helped me to avoid arguments with Patty because Patty is very difficult to live with. <laughs> That's not true. I'm just, I'm just busting on her. She'll tell you, I'm hard to live with. We, I, I have weedisms. I act like Uncle Junior once in a while. And you know what? These three things have helped me deal with those in my life. You ask the staff. It helps me to be a better leader. To know how I need to talk to my staff. How I need to coach them. And when I violate these, I, I, I catch them. I've gone to employees and said, I am sorry for the way I said that. Because when I said that, even though this piece of information is true, I was all caught up in myself and I disrespected you. Now, I didn't really disrespect them in the way you think of. I just devalued them. What I really did was made myself more important. You see, when we get an extra heartbeat, that extra heartbeat really is about self. We begin to get self-oriented. You know, as, as we have spent time with Jason, it's been a long time since we've, since we've had babies in the home. And, in fact, I took out one of the photo albums the other night, and I was right before I went to bed, I was just looking at baby pictures of Kyle and Caleb when they were little tiny babies. And I kept, Patty said, are you okay when she came to bed? No, I wasn't because I was crying. Because I'm seeing my little babies that are now married One's a father now, and my, next, my youngest son's about to get married, and I'm kind of nostalgic. And, and I got thinking about babies as I was doing that. I'm thinking, you know what? Those suckers don't give you anything back. <laughs> babies are outright expensive. The national average, it takes $250,000 per child. From the time they're zero to 18 to feed them and clothe them, and you know, you know how it is. And I'm like, wait a minute. And yet, those babies, they make us so happy. You know, I'm noticing like Mary and Kyle, and when they bring Jason over, and we goo-goo and gaga, we were over there Thursday night, and I had, you know, he was throwing up on Patty, and he was drooling all over me, and I was thrilled. My arms are tired from lifting him. He's like 14 pounds now. You know, you hold him out, you know, you get tired, you know, I don't have any hips, so I can't put him on the hips. You women got hips. And I'm like... It's all about Jason. It's all about him. And I'm like, this makes me happy. That's what I mean by respect. You see, what I found in my experience has been 
that people that value other people as more important than themselves and put other people first when they're giving to the relationship to the people or to whatever they're into, they're happier. But what I found is when people come to me and talk to me and they're focused on their happiness and what makes them happy and that they can't be happy, I find they're miserable. Now, I don't know if that's 100% true. I'm sure there's things in our lives that it's not true. You're constantly serving. I get tired of serving sometimes and have to take a break. And, you know, I say, you know, I love serving people, but Lord, do I have to serve so many? But my point being is that the first foundation of a healthy relationship is two people whose hearts or a group of people whose hearts are more concerned about the other than they are themselves and when we begin to lose that orientation that focus we begin to develop a selfish extra heartbeat that begins whether it's them the other one or whether it's us that begins to cause wear and tear on the relationship it's probably easier for us to see that in somebody else than it is ourselves. So let's start there. When you're in a relationship with somebody that's a narcissist, you know what that term means? It's all about them. They'll wear you out, won't they? You know. Now, most of us aren't narcissists, but we can get self-oriented, and we begin to make ourselves as the most important person. And so if they're doing it or if we're doing it, it begins to create wear and tear on the relationship. And so this morning, I want to talk about four questions we need to ask ourselves. You see, now the tendency is when people come into my office to get marriage counseling or premarital counseling, the normal thing that happens, and I can't say it happens 100% of the time, but it happens a lot, is for the people that are having problems to come in, and when they talk about themselves, they're golden. Look what I do. Look at how hard I'm working, but them... This woman God gave me. Boy, she's not carrying her weight. All she does is take care of the kids. All she does is take care of the house. I'm on the back burner. That's the number one complaint I get from men. I'm on the back burner. So I tell them, sir, if you'd help around the house, you might not be in the back burner. Right, ladies? <laughs> Guys, I just helped you tremendously. You want romance on Friday? Vacuum on Monday. Guys say, that sucks. It does, but it's worth it, and it works. You want more romance? Make it about the other one. Make it about them. Make them the most important person in your life. So if we're going to have healthy relationships, or we're going to diagnose where we go off, and you know what's amazing about this is I find these three values, I can violate all three of them in, in one hour. I can be right in a groove and, and be right and consistent with them, be respectful, be relevant, be responsible. I can be fine until 8.30 in the morning, and then I can turn on a dime, and I can violate these. But what's interesting about this is now that I'm aware of these, I can catch myself before they take root. So four questions we want to diagnose our own heart this morning. And then, see, because here's the deal. If you get good at looking at your own heart and, and the things that cause you to be self-centered or disrespectful, it's easy to begin to diagnose what's happening in somebody else and then know better how to handle that, which we're going to talk about through this series. Well, let's start with our own heart. Four questions to ask yourself. Number one, what or who is the most important thing in your life, really? Really? Who is most important? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Now, how do we know who or what is the most important thing in our lives? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Jesus tells us how to know what is really the most important thing or things in our lives. He says, do not lay up, verse 19... Treasures for yourselves on earth. Where? That's the key verse, key word in, this ver in these verses. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So he says, don't lay up treasures on earth because you've got to protect them. You've got you to put them in a safe. You've got you to take care of them. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where in heaven you don't have to worry about moth nor rust 
that destroys, nor where, where thieves do not break in and steal. He said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let's ask the question, what's the most important thing in my life? What's the most important thing in your life? You can tell by two things. Number one, what you treasure. And how do you know what you treasure? That's what you protect. And I was saying last night in the Saturday night service, which is going well, I was sharing out last night, you know, one of the ways you can tell what you treasure is by what you protect. For instance, I said, I said, I have a couple of little fire safes in my home. They're anchored to the, to the floor so a, so a thief can't make off with them. And I have like sixty or $70,000 in those safes. No, I don't. I said last night, I don't keep money in there. I keep, may, may, at, at most, I have a couple hundred dollars on me at all times. I don't have a lot of cash. So if you're a thief here this morning needing Jesus, don't stop by my house. You're not going to get anything but papers. But I keep all my important papers in there. In fact, I just got from the Library of Congress this week, I just got my official copyright from the Library of Congress for my book. And so that's an important paper that's going to go in the safe because that's important to me. You see, what is important to you, you protect. So if you begin to look at yourself and ask the question, what am I protecting? You might find out what's really the most important thing in your life. I watch it with, with parents and how they protect their kids because their kids are important. That's a good thing to protect. Not everything that we find is important is bad. How many guys here? Or maybe the ladies. You're, one of the last things you do at night is you go around the house and make sure all the doors are locked. See, I do that every night. I'm almost OCD. No, I am OCD on that. I got to touch it. Check it. In fact, if, they, if, if my kids don't push the door in so it clicks, I get aggravated. It's half unlocked. Who do you think you are leaving my house unlocked? See, because I'm a little paranoid, like I want to protect, but I want to protect my family. Children. We protect our children. I, I've watched Patty over the years, and it's like, you know, she's always trying to protect Caleb or Kyle from something. And it's, you know, like, you know, it kind of gets on their nerves a little bit. You know how they are? Oh, come on, Mom. I mean, my wife and I have told you a story before that both of us are like this. In fact, I shouldn't even throw you under the bus because I'm just as bad, if not worse. First two times my son drive, I told him about all the horrors that can happen on the road. <laughs> He's driving down the road. <laughs> a fox could come out. <laughs> I said, what's wrong with us? We're paranoid. They make medicine for that. Let's go get our annual checkup and get a pill from Dr. Hale. <laughs> My gosh, woman, you got a problem. But it's because we love them. I was watching a movie once with Sean Connery and the line, it was, I think it was Camelot, and he, and he asks Sir Lancelot, he says, do you fear anything? And he had real bravado. I'm a man. No, I don't fear anything. He said, then you don't love anything. What a great line. Because if you love something, you're going to fear it being harmed. You're going to try to protect it. So I ask you the question when you leave here this morning, it's through the week, begin to ask. I do this all the time to myself. I say, God, and I talk to God because I talk to God all the time. People think I'm nuts. I'm driving down the road. You know, I thank God for the little phones now in the ear that you see people talking to themselves because I was doing that well before those phones. God, what's really most important to me? Well, what are you protecting? What are you holding on to? Now, some protection's good. You know, when, when we fell with Adam in the Garden of Eden, sin not only destroyed us through sin, causing guilt, but it also caused something in our nature to self-protect. Now, self-protection is not all bad. You know, when somebody comes in, I remember years ago, I was... This was before I met Patty. I was living at home, and I was about 20 years old. I remember one night I was sleeping. I was, I was at the other end of the house, and the rest of the family was at the other end. And one night a, a picture with glass fell off the wall and crashed to the floor. And I'll never forget, because I was by the back door, that I'll never forget that when I heard that, my instinct was by the time that thing basically crumbled, I was up out of my bed addressing it. Because I was going to self-protect. 
See, that's natural to us. And that would be a good time to self-protect. Somebody coming into the house, I got news for you. I do have a shotgun, so if you come in at night, late at night, you might want to ring the doorbell or knock. Because I've already said we're paranoid. So if you hear that, you might want to hightail it out of there. And I'm a pretty good shot. I, I shoot clays. I can get you when you're running. Now, the guy named Abraham is the father of our faith, according to the book of Genesis. And we read a story where in ja Genesis chapter 12 that God promises Abraham, he says, Abraham, I'm going to make you, I'm going to bless the world through you. I'm going to make you a blessing. I'm going to make your name great. He gives him all these wonderful goodies. And then right after that story, Abraham travels down to Egypt. And the first thing he does, after God just told him, I'm going to make your name great. The world's going to be blessed by you. You're my man. He goes into Egypt. And he self-protects. He hides behind his wife. He tells his wife, he says, hey, when we go to Egypt, you're so, you're so hot that you need to tell everybody there you're my sister because they're going to want you in their harem, and I'm afraid they're going to kill me. Now, self-protection self becomes bad when we protect ourselves at someone else's expense. I didn't make this distinction last night, and it's a very important one. See, self-protection is natural. You have to protect yourself. People will hurt you. But when we self-protect, we've got to make sure we're not hurting back. And that's, this is what happens when we, be, and we become more, most important or more important. And when we become more important to ourselves than other people, we automatically, it's automatic, we devalue others. Others become less important. And that's where the rub starts in relationships. And we have to constantly maintain. I've been married 28 wonderful years. Man, my marriage is better now than it was in the beginning. One of the things that we've had to learn to do is keep the other one first. And I mean in the midst of the heat of the battle. You, you, you know, Patty and I get along 99.9% .9 of the time. But you, all of you would love to be a fly on the wall in our car when we're traveling through the city. We ain't perfect. Patty's telling me to go left, right, and I'm saying, would you make up your mind? I'm listening to her, the GPS. I'm listening to her, not you. And we have to, you know, we, you know I said the other day, I have to confess. I, I, I told her I snapped at her when we went up to, to see John on the way to your surgery. We got in an argument. We were going out of the city, though. You're already out of surgery. You were doing fine. And she's saying, and I, no, it was on the way in. And I snapped at her, and she said, don't talk to me that way. I said, well, you talk to me that way first. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. 28 years of marriage, folks, is of where I've gotten to. But I knew immediately what I violated. I made it about how I'm feeling. She was feeling her own things. What would have happened if in that moment I said, Patty, God loves you. How are you feeling at this moment? <laughs> it would have been nicer at the home later on, I can tell you. What's most important? Number two, and I've got to move along. Ask yourself what your heart is feeding on. I I'm just going to warn you, folks. If you want great relationships, don't listen to the TV, don't listen to Cosmopolitan, don't listen to Dr. Ruth, don't listen to all these things you're hearing out there, because they're going to mess your relationships up. The world's idea of a good relationship is having somebody that makes you happy, that does everything you want. Just do a search of magazines, covers. Just go through Wal Walmart or Food Lion or wherever you look at the covers of the magazines. Do you ever see on the magazines how to put your spouse first? There might be a few out there, but you got to cut through all the junk. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Let me put that in the simple Bob Wee translation. Garbage in, garbage out. So our relationship, our heart, relationship health is being affected by the junk that you and I hear and see every day out in the world. Whether we like it or not, you can't go anywhere. You, they don't sell anything anymore without sex. My gosh, they can't sell anything without a beautiful woman or a beautiful man or some kind of twist or turn or innuendo. And what that does is slowly it gets us 
focusing on. They, and they focus when they do marketing. They say to you things like, you deserve it. You need to pamper yourself and treat yourself. And all that does is feed our hearts with this self-orientation. Who said you deserve it? I don't feel like I deserve anything now. The older I get in the Lord, the more I realize, God, everything you've given me is by grace. I didn't deserve any of it. I'm thankful for it, but when I start getting like, I really deserve this, man, like I work hard. It changes something in us. And when we begin to focus on these things, it's who we become. John Maxwell said years ago, I heard him say this, and I wrote this down, and I've never forgotten it. He said, what you focus on, you'll become within five years. So if you really obsess or focus on something, that's going to develop who you become. And so we have to be careful what our hearts are feeding on. So ask yourself the question, what are you feeding on? I said last night, I said, guys, do you really think? 45-minute sermon, maybe 50 this morning, by Pastor Bob is going to undo 168 hours of feeding on ungodly, anti-biblical, cultural issues. It's not going to happen, folks. I'm just not that good. What are we feeding on? Number three, ask yourself, who am I really trying to make happy? I mean, really, who is it that I'm trying to please? You know, worship, really, you might want to write this down. Worship Connect Serve is what we focus on. Worshiping God, connecting to one another, and serving our community. That's what we're about. But what is worship? Worship, excuse me, is simply seeking to make God happy. You know, 2 Samuel chapter 7 tells the story of one King David who, after he had been successful at being a king and he he had conquered all his enemies and life was going good for him it says in verse 1 of chapter 7 now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house and the lord had given him rest from all his enemies around paul we were talking about enemies this morning the king said to nathan the prophet see now i dwell in a house of cedar but the ark of god dwells inside tent curtains and then nathan said this is the prophet said to the king go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, I want you to see this. David is like looking around. He's saying, my gosh, look at all that God's done for me. I want to do something that makes God happy. And I want you to notice with that disposition that's called worship, I want to make God happy. That the prophet, now a prophet is somebody God speaks to directly. I've met a few in my life. Not a lot, but I've met a few, and I tell you what, they'll make you nervous. You know, I, I go, Harold Eberle is a prophet that I know, and when he, we go out to dinner, he'll make a comment. I say, now, are you speaking as a prophet, or are you just being funny? Because he'll make you nervous, won't it, Patty? They really hear from God. I've met a few. Not a lot. I've met some fakes, too, but I've met some real ones. They really have a hotline to heaven. That, that's what this guy Nathan is. And Nathan says, hey, go do what's in your heart. And I want you to know this. When our hearts are focused on God and others first, and that we are focused on making others happy first and serving them, you can trust your heart. What comes into your heart to do, you can say, hey, I'm going to follow that because your heart is aligned with God. It's aligned with people. You're not putting yourself above them. Then you really can trust your heart. And often God will give you direction just by putting something in your heart. Of course, God goes on to say, he answers David. says, now David, let me teach you a little lesson here. He tells the prophet to go tell David, I don't want you building me a temple. I'm happy with you for the fact that you desire to build me a temple, but I'm quite happy in a tent. And I'm going to let your son build me a temple. But David, I want to remind you that you can't outgive me. That I want, I'm more concerned about what you get than what I get. And yet when our hearts stay focused on pleasing him, it's amazing how it comes in the back door and we are blessed. But David, he says, David, this is what the Lord wants you to know. He says, I took you from the sheepfold. You are nobody. I took you from following the sheep to be ruler over my people. Look what I did for you. David, I'm so happy that you want to do for me, but I want you to know you'll never outgive me. He says, and I've been with you wherever you've gone, and you need to study where the man went. And I have cut off all your enemies. 
And I have made your name great, like the name of the great men on the earth. I want you to think about this. David's on Entertainment Tonight. He's on CNN News. He's on Fox. God said, I did that for you, David. David, I just want you to understand, I'm so thrilled that your heart is to make me happy. But David, I want you to know that what makes me happy is to make you happy. Moreover, he says, I'm going to make you a house. I'm going to build you a house, David. You don't need to build me a house. Folks, we need to ask ourselves, and I ask myself this question probably more than all the other ones. Bob, who are you really trying to make happy here? Why are you doing this? Are you doing this to get something? Like giving, for instance. Now, I believe if you give, God gives back. But I can't ever remember a time that I've ever given my tithe expecting something back. I've tithed since I was 18 years of old. I'm not bragging. But I'm here to tell you that whenever I've had a major crisis financially in my life, it's amazing how God has shown up. But I don't give like I'm going to give $10 this week hoping to get 100 And I wouldn't advise you to do that either because that's not really giving. But it's amazing to me how I can't outgive God. Now, you can give stupid. If you give to get, that's giving stupid. I've seen people go bankrupt doing that. Don't do that. But I want you to understand the heart of God. He's not trying to take anything from you. Even when you give, his intention is to give you much back more than you ever gave. So I ask myself, and I would encourage you, ask yourself, when you get in a little tiff with your wife or you're at the job and you and your boss are going at it, or fellow employees or family, Who's it really about? Am I trying to make me happy or God and others? And finally, ask yourself this question. How concerned or sensitive am I about other people? You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, we read the story when David is, he's being chased by Saul. Saul, Saul chased David for 10 years. I want you to think about this. I want you to take your age what it is right now, and I want you to mine is 10 years. That's when his trouble started. For 10 years, this man chased David down, and this story is towards the end of it, so it's been about eight or nine years, I don't remember exactly, but it's toward the latter end of this, and David is being chased by Saul, and the Bible tells us that he comes to a certain cave, and David and his men are hiding from Saul, and they're so close that Saul goes into this cave because he wants to use it as a port john And the Bible says that Saul came into the cave, and it was obviously very dark, because Saul sits down to relieve himself, and the Bible says that somebody in the group said this to David. He said that in verse 4, then the men of David said this to him. This is the day, they get real spiritual, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as seems good to you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I've been chased by this guy who's trying to kill me, he's thrown javelins at me to try to nail me to the wall, he's ruined my life, he's ruined my fortune, he's ruined everything in my life, and the man is sitting there on the toilet. We're going to have some fun. It's payback time. And then somebody says, hey, and this is what the Lord said. Be careful when the people tell you this is what the Lord said. You, David, right now, you can take every problem in your life and flush it down that toilet. Now watch what David did. And David arose secretly. And cut off the corner of Saul's robe. This was an act of disrespect. Because kings in that culture, their legs were never exposed. The only ones who would gird their loins and bring their, their, they would bring their robe from their ankles and tie it around their waist were slaves. And for David to cut this garment meant that Saul's legs would be exposed. And also by the Torah, the law, and a garment that was not complete was unfit and unclean. And so in two aspects, David disrespected Saul. Now, he didn't kill him, which would have been much more disrespect. But he disrespected him by cutting his garment. And watch what happens. And it says, now, it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him 
because he had cut Saul's robe. Now, I just want you to get the feel of this. The man's trying to kill you, and all you do is take a little snippet out of his robe, and your conscience is bothering you. You know why? Because David, through this whole journey, had respected God and people. Others were more important to David than David was. And I am convinced that this, not David's worship, is the number one reason why God called David to be king. I am convinced of this. No one will ever convince me otherwise. That David's heart for God and David's heart for people is what qualified him to be the ruler and shepherd of his people. Not his abilities, not his vision, not his success, but that his heart was submitted to God, and it was sensitive to other people, and so that even in the midst of this environment where he really must have been tired and worn out, sick and tired, had every reason to disrespect back. And have you not been in those situations where people treat you like dirt? They treat you like junk? They treat you like dog doo-doo? Don't you feel like I'm justified to disrespect back? Is that not what we do, tit for tat? If anybody ever had a reason to be that, it was David. But his heart troubled him. Then he said to his men, he, re he restrains his men. He says, do not touch the Lord's anointed to stretch out. My, I will not touch the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Now, there's two things in there, respect for God and respect for people right there. David went to make himself happy and cut the corner of his garment. But his heart was sensitive enough that when he did it, he realized he made a mis mistake. That's what I'm trying to get you to see with this respect value. You're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. You and I cut people's garments all the time. But what we want to do is develop a heart that says, wait a minute, I violated something. I need to make that right. I need to put this genie back in the bottle. I need to get this right. And we've been practicing it on our staff with the hope of it coming into our church. And if I do wrong, if I'm disrespectful, you ask the staff, I will apologize and make it right. Because that's what God wants to do in us. It's hard to swallow our pride sometimes, but we have to do it. David went on to protect Saul. Wow. David didn't stop there, but verse 8 says, And David also arose afterwards went out of the cave and called out to Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. He did respect to a man that was putting a lid on his life. Saul was trying to lid David because he was afraid of David. Saul was trying to kill David because he knew he would replace him as king. And he chased him down and he harassed him and he made his life a living hell. And David said, I'm going to respect God and I'm going to respect that man, even though that man, if he was really honest, was a jerk. Now let's examine our hearts. Who is really the most important thing in our lives? What are we feeding our hearts on? Are we feeding our hearts on? I don't mind going to movies. I'm not telling you not go to a movie because I plan to go to movies. Summertime, there are always good movies coming out. I get a lot of good sermons from the theater. I'm not talking about that. What are we feeding our hearts on? Are we concerned enough about pleasing God or is it about ourselves? You know, one of the challenges we have in church today is that you can grow a big church if you just become consumeristic. Just give people what they want. And you can grow numbers. Man, if I just have pizza and beer and football games here, I could fill this church four or five times a week free. You don't think so? Try it. You ever been to a wedding? Watch how they line up for the free beer. That's not what we're after. I'm not talking about as we develop an outreach to the community and just getting better at giving everybody what they want. What I'm talking about is beginning to value people as more important than ourselves. 
and then ministering to their needs, not to their wants. You see, because if we minister to their wants and they come here, we're going to create consumers that disrespect everybody else because you're going to turn into a need-meeting unit. Have you ever felt that? You're just here to meet my needs. Look, if you do that in a marriage, it's, not, it's going to be cold in your home. My wife does not exist just to meet my needs. Now, I have certain needs, and as she loves me and she puts my needs first, my needs get met, but I'm supposed to put her needs equally first or more important for me. And as we do that, it's amazing what harmony begins to develop. And that's true of a church. That's true of a community. It's true of a nation. One of the problems we have right now in our country is we're filled with consumers. We have leaders that are leading for their own well-being. They, a lot of them, now there's some great ones out there, and I know some. I could name some people that would embarrass them if I named them. But I've met them, I've walked with them, I've talked with them. They are great leaders, but they're not enough of them in the political world or in the world of leadership. They're surrounded by people that are just seeking to consume for their own lusts. Folks, we can be a light in the darkness by being a community that's going to value other people greater than ourselves, but not being a soft touch for giving people what they need. Do you hear the balance or want? But where are our hearts? Are we concerned more about pleasing ourselves? Are our hearts sensitive to the needs, desires, and wishes of others? Folks, I am convinced that God is forming a group of people here that are going to have the heart of David to lead and to rule and to impact and to influence for the greater good. And that's where I've been leading you for my tenure. Many of the major things that we've done here have not been by accident. It's been very intentional as we develop the DNA of our community. These core values are the DNA. But the practical side of this DNA, these core values, is, folks, if you'll begin to take respect, responsibility, and relevance, and we're going to explain them more clearly over the next few weeks, and begin to go out of here and write them down, understand what we mean. Respect means, you may want to write this down, that I put God and others first, then I consider my own needs. I am not saying do not consider your own needs. I'll end with this thought. Last night I was sharing. When I put myself first, I tend not to see anybody else. See, if I put my needs and desires first, the tendency for me, and I think I'm a lot like you, is to trample upon other people's needs and desires. And I don't do it intentionally, it just kind of happens. But what I've noticed is if I put God first and my wife second and my kids like a really distant third, <laughs> now if I put them before me, my needs still get taken care of. But it doesn't work the same in reverse. And so we have to constantly monitor our hearts and look for that extra heartbeat. Is it becoming about Bob? And see, oh, you were supposed to make it about Bob. It's all about me. No, Rick Warren got it right years ago when he wrote his Purpose Driven Life. He starts out his book by saying, it's not about you. Folks, I promise you, if for one year, you'll begin to focus every conversation, everything you do, and ask yourself, who is really most important here? And you'll begin to put yourself second. I promise it will transform your relationships and it will transform you. Now, if you're in a relationship with somebody who's the narcissist, who has an irregular heartbeat, who is selfish, you need to continue in this series because we're going to try to give you some tools that will help with that because you do need help. We have to confront that in people, but we cannot do that if we don't check out our own heartbeat first. I want to make sure that nobody's feeling any guilt. This is not a guilt sermon. This is a sermon that will help us examine ourselves and say, Father, really at this moment, 
Who's it really about? I'm just here to tell you, folks, God is my witness. It has saved me from arguing with my wife and my staff and other people many, many times. Because you know what I realized? Often, even when I'm right, my focus is still about me. And it messes everything up. I preached this sermon last night. This one's better. I hope. On the way home, we started talking about something, and I could feel it rise within me, didn't we? I was tired, getting grumpy. Everybody else got to eat wonderful, sweet snacks. But I couldn't eat them because I had to preach. So I was irritable. I'm going home getting some cookies. And we started talking about something, and I started making it about me. So we just said, let's just table this. Because the truth is, when I'm tired, when you're tired, when you're stressed, or when you're hungry, you're going to get an extra heartbeat. Father, I pray that this morning someone has heard something that will help them. Not condemn them. This is not about guilt. This is about growth. Lord, it is like breathing to us to make things about us. But Lord, you are calling this church to become a group of people that learn how to love you in worship, that learn how to love one another in biblical community, and le learns how to love its community through service. And Lord, it starts right here. Help us to grow in this, and when we fail, and we will fail, I may not even get out of the parking lot today without messing this up, but when we do, help us to catch it and help us to get ourselves back aligned with what we're teaching. Father, help your people to be the body, the community, the sheepfold with the heart of the shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. Father, bless, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Next week, we'll start on another value. And the next week, we're going to do four weeks. And so if you're here this morning and you need prayer for anything, there'll be some folks here at the front of the sanctuary. Love to pray with you. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, these folks will be here to pray with you, explain that. If you're a first-time guest, exit the sanctuary. If you're on this side, turn right. You'll see starting point. If you're on this side and going out that door, you're going to turn left. Right there in the middle is our starting point. They want to ask you some questions, find out you got here, and answer any questions you have. God bless you, Patty. Have I forgotten anything? All right, we'll see you next week. God bless you. Thanks for coming.